Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you've been listening, we've already had our debate on table two. So are there any questions? <laughs> uh, we've, had a, we've had a great time um, on, uh, on the table talking with, uh, with Judith Sloan, our guest, and John Quiggan, our guest. And let me tell you, they don't agree. Uh, <laughs> but fortunately, they've agreed to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Uh, you probably know Judith because she's a regular feature on, on the Q&A program. Uh, quite a lot, but what you may not know is she's a director of the Lower Inst Lowy Institute. Uh, she's an economist and company director with the Westfield Group. Uh, she's also, I'm sure you know, contributing economics editor to The Australian. Uh, John Quiggan is uh, a man who's very well known in Brisbane, probably doesn't need much uh, introduction. From my memory, John was appointed by the Beatty government to the Competition Authority some years ago, I think it was, John, uh, and uh, is a bit of a go-to man for journalists like me when we're trying to show balance. Uh, different times, uh, uh, which has its own unique problems itself. Uh, the great thing about doing uh, stories uh, in the current climate is no matter who we interview, we're always accused of bias. My ta the table two, the final conclusion was the media is the problem. Um, so I look forward to the discussion today. Each of our guests is going to give a talk for about 15 minutes, then they'll uh, take a seat over here, they'll have lapel mics and there'll be a roving microphone so that you can uh, finally get one over the, the big name economists uh, today. So would you please welcome first of all to the podium Judith Sloan. Uh, thanks very much. You didn't mention the fact that I'm kind of a Queenslander now. Uh, really? Yeah. You know, we, uh, we live a bit of our life up on the Sunshine Coast and uh, Graham Hancroft's uh, driven me down today, so uh, I'm uh, sort of getting into the banana way of things. Um, okay. So uh, have I, am I, do you want me to do this? Okay. I have got, did you? Okay, here we go. Okay. 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 Um, well, thanks very much for having me. It's a bit problematic, I think, always um, it, it, arguing with John Quiggan because, you know, you're a bit like wrestling an eel, I think, John, but uh, <laughs> maybe you think the same of me. Um, and so what I thought I'd do uh, is to try and uh, see, in terms of the debate, whether we could actually agree on some points. Now, my guess is that John will be saying, oh, well, no, not really. But, you know, it would be nice, I think, if there could be some agreed points. So do you accept the proposition, for example, I would say in my debating style, I was in youth parliament once upon a time, um, that at the end of the day, employment is determined at the intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue products. So firms will only employ people when it is profitable to do so. Uh, now, we can have a bit of a debate about, you could say that's over the medium term, you know, firms might rationally hoard workers, but at the end of the day, there is nothing that will eliminate that economic rule. Remember we were having that discussion, what do we want our economics graduates to understand? I want them to understand that point. I also want John to accept the point, which hopefully he can, is that the labour market has some special features but lots of markets have special features, and at the end of the day, it is a market. It is an exchange between buyers and sellers, and it is particularly related to what alternatives those buyers and sellers have in terms of the transaction. So if John could accept the fact that the labour market is a market, that would be great. Um, the third point is I don't think the macroeconomics tells you much. I'm hoping for some sort of, you know, body language here, John. <laughs> oh, you don't agree with that? <laughs> okay, well, there we go. I knew it was going to be tricky. But it seems to me that if you trot out the sort of macroeconomic outcomes associated with different labour market regulatory regimes, it doesn't tell you much. I can tell you, for example, that the macroeconomic outcomes under work choices, which actually in its full-blown version only lasted for about 15 months, were actually much better than the macroeconomic outcomes associated with the Fair Work Act. So in terms of employment growth, in terms of unemployment, in terms of industrial disputes, uh, in terms of productivity, Work Choices was better than Fair Work Australia. And I'm assuming, John, that you don't think that tells us much. Because 
what, what is the macroeconomic outcome is clearly determined by a very large number of things and the labour market regulation regime at the time. Particularly, it's also what employers think the labour market regulation regime is going forward uh, will not have a huge bearing or you cannot overinterpret the macroeconomic outcomes. Um, Okay, he agrees with me. Yeah, see, this is my ploy, everyone. Um, the, the, the fourth point, you must also agree with me, <laughs> is that it's okay to think about productivity, and I mean John Quiggan's um, uh, hero, uh, Paul Krugman, believes that at the end of the day, productivity is everything. Uh, but the explanations of productivity are complex and multifactorial, so they are not just about the labour market regulation. They are in part about the labour market regulation as far as I'm concerned, but they're not entirely about that. Now, the last one is, I think, which is an important concession if John's prepared to make this, no one disputes that at the end of the day that too much labour market regulation would have bad effects. Now, I'm, I make that point, it's a really serious point because if you honestly believe that how the government regulates the labour market has no effect, then we're not being serious. I mean, we shouldn't have the minimum wage at $15. We should have it at $30 or $50 or $100. And if you genuinely don't believe that employment protection laws, unfair dismissal and the like has no impact, let's get serious. Let's give everyone permanent jobs for life because it has no impact. Now. My guess is that very few people can go that, that go that far. So what we are now talking about is where is the balance? Where is the balance in terms of labour market regulations, which I guess are undertaken essentially for political reasons, creates a sort of a net effect which is acceptable? And that's uh, one of my uh, points I want to make. Okay, I'll go very quickly through this and maybe John also doesn't agree with this, but it seems to me productivity is really important. And so regulation, industrial relations regulations, is, sits there as an under, underlying influence. No one says that if you change industrial relations regulations, it will directly improve productivity. It is a facilitative factor, right? So it enables employers to do things. It also prevents them from doing things. So it is important but it is not actually an immediate source of productivity growth. Okay, product, here's the productivity figures. Um, hard to dispute, I hope. Uh, uh, I know that John regards the period of the 90s as just a matter of work intensification. I don't think that's right. But we have measured this consistently, and it clearly has been incredibly ugly in terms of what's been happening in terms of productivity well, it's not growth anymore. It's actually a decrement in the most recent figures. They're the best figures. So market sector, multi-factor over the course of a business cycle. And what this is showing you is that basically what we're getting in terms of uh, gains in uh, per capita income is the terms of trade, which of course is just dumb luck. We've got a bit of um, work intensi well, more work intensification, so the contribution from hours work, an enormous increase from capital expenditure, and then not much from productivity. So it's, a, it's in distinct uh, contrast with what happened in the 1990s. Take the terms of trade away, you'll definitely take the capital accumulation away, and the future in terms of per capita income growth is looking quite ugly, unless we can do something about that navy blue line. And, you know, to think that productivity is just an international phenomenon determined by technology frontiers, if that were the case, then every country in the world would have the same productivity uh, and the same productivity growth. But this also shows you that it is actually very variable. Australia's done badly recently compared with the 90s, but there are some countries that have actually done quite well. So there is uh, a, a very, you know, there is a sort of what I call a koala story to this. So we have to think about what has happened in the 2000s in particular, which has uh, weighed down on multi-factor productivity growth and continues to weigh down on it. <clears throat> 
So why is labour market regulation important? I love my little picture, by the way, don't you? I think that's like that's the queen, those people over in the Queensland Department of Health. Um, um, so, you know, everyone must accept, you know, labour is uh, a huge part of the economy. If you cut the economy that way, it's over half of the, half of the economic pie. So obviously it's important. Obviously the availability, quality and flexibility of labour imports are very important in terms of how investors see the world. And therefore, when you think about international investment, comparisons will be drawn between these things. So we've, it really is important. I mean, I guess a debating point might be that, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever, is not very important. But the truth of the matter is that when uh, investments are considered, these things are very important. I was sat on the board of Santos for a very long time, and believe me, the whole issue of labour, labour availability, the cost of labour, was a very important consideration. So there we have, uh, it is true that most uh, governments around the world intervene in the labour markets. And I guess here is an important point, you know, what are these market failures? And maybe that's the point John will raise. And I guess, you know, these social policy objectives. And I'd go back to the point, that if there are social policy objectives, we have to look at the costs as well as the benefits. If I think of Australia, it's important to uh, kind of tease out, if you're going to do some work on this area, what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, one size fits all minimum wages and conditions and modern awards. Okay, that is an area that you might want to look at because, you know, the fact that if someone's paying an award, you know, that the baker in Port Augusta has to pay the same as the baker in Bondi, uh, it does seem a little extreme, you know. So we've got a one-size-fits-all there. Then we've got the enterprise bargaining rules and how that is also, uh, uh, I think, particularly bearing into, for big business, how that they can uh, access in flexible ways labour and the costs, and then this employment protection. And then actually, finally, because... Interestingly enough, Australia always had a very um, heavy-handed uh, approach to labour market regulation, but there was no compliance uh, because the compliance was left in the hands of the trade unions and they never did anything, particularly for small business. We now have a very well-resourced uh, fair work ombudsman full of uh, law graduates who can't get jobs elsewhere. Um, it's true. And, uh, you know, so small businesses now, if they don't comply with the law, I think become very fearful that the nice men and women from the Fair Work Ombudsman will come knocking. Um, I would add, and I, I've got my friend Graham here, and add to that, that we have this very strange rule in Australia where there is a monopoly right given to trade unions. That is weird. Now, all economists know monopolies are bad. All economists know monopolies are bad. And yet we have a regulatory arrangement which basically confers monopoly status on particular trade unions. That's something we should look at and that's something we should get rid of. So uh, I won't keep on going for too long. Um, so I think they're very... If you started... If you wanted to do some work in this, it's clearly different for big and small business. Uh, for small business, uh, which is a particular issue in Queensland because Queensland has a disproportionate number of small businesses. The uh, modern awards and penalty rates and unfair dismissal are creating the real issue. And for big business, uh, it's more about uh, the scope for unions to interfere. See, don't you like that? It's jumping up and down. So uh, there we go. If we're going to have a debate, uh, and I guess in one sense I would have uh, an institutional advantage over you, John, because I understand all these things. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I guess it's always important and good for my personality to hear uh, someone uh, come at it from a different angle. So just finally, I've got uh, two thought-provoking slides. I think this is interesting, even though I said I didn't think the macroeconomics told you anything. This is a really interesting chart. So, OK, here we've got employed persons and we've got aggregate monthly hours. So if we look back at the recession that occurred 
in the early 90s. Basically, there is a kind of contiguity between employed persons and working hours. So basically, you got quite, you got a very big jump in unemployment. Remember, unemployment uh, went to actually over 10% to over 11% at that point in time. And here we're going along here. And when the GFC hit um, in late, uh, or sort of uh, third quarter 2008, it was interesting that uh, employed persons basically went flat. Uh, and all the adjustment was taken in terms of um, hours of work. Now, of course, the industrial structure and the nature of work was kind of different between those two periods of time. Uh, but the kicker of that was that that period of time when it was a very equitable adjustment occurred when the work choices legislation was still in operation. And finally, I leave on this one. I, I didn't update it, but it's still pretty true. Um, Australia has the highest minimum wage in the world, or one of the highest minimum wages. And really what I'd like to know is why do people think that this is a good idea? What is it about uh, the Australian labour market that would justify us having the highest minimum wage in the world, above countries which have um, higher per capita income too, um, uh, uh, which I think is actually only offset by the fact that we have a very aggressive junior rates of pay. But when you look at those high minimum wages and then you uh, add to the penalty rates arrangements back in the modern ward, I think there is a real issue. So thanks very much. So if the audiovisual guys could put uh, a microphone on Judith on her lapel when she's ready a little bit later on. Um, as you can see, you can get a flavour for what uh, the table discussion was like over lunch. Uh, we'll see if John Quiggan does actually agree uh, with, <laughs> with any of the parameters. For obvious reasons, welcome John Quiggan. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks very much for having me. I guess uh, uh, the affirmative action for left-wing economist program works again. Um, and, um, uh, so I'll, um, I certainly, well, certainly one thing which I'll agree with Judith about is, is that productivity is complex and multifaceted. And so while I'm, while I'm going to present well, you know, the first derivative of the same slide that Judith, Judith showed, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to make strong claims on the basis of that. Uh, one problem with, as I say, being the affirmative action speaker is I rarely get to choose the, uh, the title. I don't make a big fuss about this, but I think the real question is labour market reform, who gains and who loses. And I think in that context it's striking that Judith's speech mentioned uh, the concerns of small business, the concerns of big business, uh, the big problem caused by the minimum wage. Uh, the concerns of the people who actually work for a living didn't get mentioned, as far as I can hear, once. And uh, that's because they're the people who are going to lose from... Um, uh, labour market reform, they're the people who have consistently lost from labour market reform in those jurisdictions where it's been pushed substantially more than in Australia. Everybody understands this, uh, it seems, except economists. And uh, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, there's, it, it's striking that, um, that we, we see, you know, here are the list of the kind of people you can see in the paper any day supporting labour market reform, the employer groups, Business Council of Australia, Commerce, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a bunch of business advocates, um, and of course uh, wealthy and powerful individuals. And although it's a little bit hard to get hold of, I mean, I think Gina Reinhart's piece in the, I think it's the Australian Mining Review, really, I think, uh, because she doesn't have any need to uh, pull any punches, uh, she really lays it on the table that um, uh, the uh, rich people have the workers over a barrel, they can do what they want, and the workers had better get used to it. And that means uh, not going to the pub and uh, accepting lower wages and, in general, uh, adjusting to the station in life appropriate to somebody who didn't inherit a billion dollars' worth of coal from, um, uh, from their father, who in turn, of course, got it given to him by the state of Western Australia. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the supporters. Um, the opponents, well, unions, of course, are, are unsurprising, I guess, from all sides of the support, but also... It's very difficult to find anybody who shows any particular interest in making the distribution of income more equal who also uh, supports uh, labour market reform. 
uh, the think tanks I mentioned, for example, all of them are in favour of uh, giving the 1% or the 10% a much better deal than they get at present. All of them in general think that perhaps, uh, with luck, this will all trickle down to the poor in the future, but, uh, but all of them are pretty much focused not only in the labour market context, but in a whole bunch of contexts on measures whose immediate effect is to benefit the well-off at the expense of uh, uh, particularly working people. And, of course, Australians in general. I mean, whatever, uh, whatever uh, we may say, uh, we, this isn't, of course, an issue of uh, hypothesis. This is lived experience. We actually had work choices. Uh, this is the government's own research uh, published in the Murdoch Press, so I think I can safely say this is not a biased or unduly, uh, unduly dark assessment of uh, what they found after spending tens of millions of dollars of public money persuading people that these policies were were exactly what they wanted. Uh, work choices is called widespread feelings of panic, fear and disempowerment among voters according to government's own research. And there's a lengthy, um, a lengthy link which when I, I put this up I'll, I'll give you which, which gives all of this uh, in chapter and verse that uh, people experienced it, they hated it, they voted the government out that introduced it and the word itself is so toxic that even though we're hearing repeatedly we need to bring back a bunch of measures which sound exactly like work choices and nobody is willing to use that word ever again. So, are these groups wrong? In my view, no. Most of the labour market reform we're currently looking at is zero sum in nature. Obviously, reductions in minimum wages, uh, the immediate and direct effect is, of course, to reduce the wages paid to workers who are bound by those minimums. Uh, there's also, though, a bunch of award minimum conditions, and again, uh, the effect of getting rid of them. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is, was particularly central to the debate over work choices was the question of whether the awards could be adjusted in a way that gave a net disadvantage to workers. And that was, that was really the sticking point. That was really the crucial thing that, uh, that this piece of, of labour market reform, uh, as introduced after 2004, carried was, uh, yes, we intend these things to make workers worse off. Uh, removal and relaxation of controls and unfair dismissals. Well, this, yeah, this really is an issue of irreconcilable conflict. You know, I've compared it uh, in my blog to a divorce from somebody on the outside. You can never tell uh, who was right and who was wrong. I, yeah, the uh, Financial Review has been pushing, of course, that this is a terrible thing. Uh, and they gave a case of an employer who felt he'd been very hard done by. And the answer was that, uh, as he told it, uh, he'd sacked an employer who wasn't very good. The employee had been keeping detailed log records purporting to have done unpaid overtime. He hadn't kept very good records, and so she took him to court and uh, he had to pay her. Uh, you know, anybody who's been through a messy relationship breakup will recognise that telling the truth of what happened there uh, is just about impossible. He had another similar case, which was similarly uh, this case. So the answer is there is no easy way of fixing this problem. If you make it very easy for workers, for employers to sack people, they'll abuse that power at the expense of employees. If you make it very hard, of course, a certain proportion of employees uh, will abuse the relationship the other way. Uh, the real question in this kind of reform is, well, which in our society, which group do you feel on the whole uh, has the harder go of things? Which group needs more help and which group uh, on the whole uh, could do without it? And um, manager's right to manage, it was on due to slides, of course. Uh, uh, from the opposite perspective, of course, workers' bosses' right to be bossy. And we know that... Um, uh, we know that any of us who's experienced manager's right to manage knows exactly how that works uh, for both good and ill, of course. So, from the, from the immediate first order perspective, this is a very straightforward issue. Should we make employers and managers better off and make workers worse off? The question is, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, as Judith did in her presentation, simply take the viewpoint of the employers, we're done. Uh, these, these measures undoubtedly will make employers better off, and if that's your concern, we should go that way. If you're not, then we really want to argue something else. We really want to say that there are substantial employment or productivity benefits, which mean that uh, in the ideal case, at least, in the ideal case, everybody will be better off, or at least that uh, the net gains will substantially offset the fact that um, uh, we've seen a redistribution from workers to employers, which perhaps can be fixed in some other way. So I hasten to mention that all of the other ways you might do this are opposed vigorously and very effectively by all the same groups pushing for labour market reform. You won't see 
very many of them are suggesting, for example, an increase in the top marginal rate of taxation. So the, the two big measures here are two big questions are employment and productivity. I just, I just want to talk about this word flexibility, though, because it sort of, um, it really is at the core of this, and it's something which, as I say, ordinary Australians understand very well, but which, uh, which in this discussion seems to be almost entirely lost. That is, that flexibility is a zero-sum good. Uh, if I can call up the employer and say, I'm feeling sick, I'm not coming in today, that's flexibility for me. Of course, it's not flexibility for the employer. If the employer, conversely, can say, um, don't need you right now, go home, uh, you'll be, you'll, I'll call you back to pay you when I feel like it, uh, that's flexibility for the employer and not for me. Uh, so, you know, the kinds of things that flexible labour markets mean are split shifts, variable hours, less pr predictability in the life of workers, and as I say, uh, the Australian public, most of whom work for a living, understand this perfectly. As they've said, the main advantages people have heard about the system, that is the flexibility which, they, uh, which millions of dollars were spent explaining to them, they correctly perceived as something which is very good for the employer, not very good for them. Now let's uh, look at the numbers and you'll see some of the same graphs Judith put up, or with slightly things. First, macro. And, um, I think maybe I misinterpret. Maybe we may be slightly more in agreement. I'm not claiming um, in this graph here. This is the U.S. And I should say, you know, the real action here, I think, comes from comparing societies broadly similar to ours, which have undertaken much more radical labour market reform, have much more flexible labour markets than we do. And we can do this either uh, since we had this d debate at lunchtime in changes or in levels. That is, we can look at the U.S which has always had a more flexible labour market than ours, but which went a long way further after the, after the election of the Reagan government in, the, in about 1980, when uh, the trade union movement was effectively broken, minimum wages were frozen in, in nominal terms and reduced dramatically in real terms and so forth. And, uh, and of course, there is a general doctrine of employment at will. That is, uh, if I turn up for work tomorrow and Flavio says, I don't like your face, uh, then I'm out. I mean, that doesn't apply in the US to universities, but it does apply uh, pretty generally that uh, the employer can sack you uh, for no reason whatsoever uh, whenever they feel like it. And the claim is that because of that capacity, employers will be much more keen to hire people uh, because they know that there's no risk of being lumbered with a bad employee. Well, let's look at a macro shock. I'm not, of course, blaming this macro shock on the structure of, of the US labour market, so in that sense I'm in agreement with, um, agreement with uh, Judith. What I'm saying is, well, what happens when you experience a severe macro shock? Does the labour market bounce back rapidly in the way that uh, we would hope as a payoff for uh, the general capacity of the employer uh, to sack us whenever he or she feels like it? And the answer very clearly is not. You can see the, uh, the drop in employment in the employment rate, uh, population ratio at the time of the crisis. Very dramatic. I haven't got the comparisons properly, but much sharper than in European countries which experience comparable uh, comparable macro shocks at the time, of the time of the crisis, and then years and years where it just bounces along, uh, bounces along the bottom. Now, I guess, um, five years into the crisis, we've seen no recovery at all in the US employment population ratio, even though GDP has recovered significantly. Uh, so uh, there's no evidence here, and I, and I can repeat this over and over again. The reaction to macro shocks is uncorrelated with the degree of labour market regulation. Except in Australia. Uh, yeah, we, I think it's very we, nice. Problem, Australia. Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't hit. The macro shock was much smaller. We had, we had, in, you know, we had. In, in, so, so to, to respond directly, since we've got, got this introduction, Judith didn't put the macro shock up on the slide. We had six quarters of severely negative GDP growth in 1990, thanks to the fiscal stimulus. Uh, we had, uh, I think, one quarter of negative growth uh, in the current GFC. So, um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, Could have been uh, much the, worse if there had been rigid labour markets in America. Um, so, um, flexible labour markets and strong GDP growth. Uh, New Zealand, yeah, those of us, the older members of the audience, will remember when you know, anybody sitting in Sydney or whatever could look up at the sky and see jet planes full of economists and uh, people from the OECD flying overhead to Wellington to find out how they did it, how they fixed the New Zealand labour market. Um, uh, Judith and I were certainly around the time in, in, various, in various ways. The, the key point, I guess, was the Employment Contracts Act in, in 1991, which uh, 
which really drastically reformed uh, the New Zealand labour market. Uh, you can, the graph isn't perfect, but you, I guess the general picture, uh, which anybody who goes to New Zealand will, will know, is uh, uh, that, um, of course, New Zealand has performed far worse than Australia. And of course, you don't need to go to New Zealand because so many New Zealanders uh, in Lennon's uh, famous phrase are voting with their feet. But they and got yet, rid of they got rid of the employment uh, contract. And there. yet, um, and yet, yeah, quickly. I, and yet, only a month ago, uh, the Financial Review uh, is saying uh, New Zealand shows us the way in labour market regulation. I mean, I, I yeah, at this point, I really find it impossible to believe that um, yeah, faced with a record of failure as dramatic as that for New Zealand, that uh, they can still be touting as a model is, is just utterly unbelievable. But it, it is. Uh, I'm not claiming here again that the macro disasters. Caught, yeah, the macro disasters which drove this outcome in New Zealand in the 1990s were caused by the Employment Contracts Act, uh, but certainly, uh, certainly the, 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 the claim which we frequently hear in Australia that in some sense the much more modest reforms we had are responsible for our good macro outcomes are absolutely refuted by New Zealand experience. So I hope this, yeah. So this is the US, and we actually see the macro outcomes on the income distribution. You can see that. Up to the 1970s, uh, the US, you know, these are log scales, so it's a very nicely drawn graph. I pinched it from Wikipedia. These are log scales in income. Um, what you can see is that up until the 1970s and a bit afterwards, uh, the, um, the, um, uh, all groups in the US uh, were doing well. As the phrase, had it a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, from the um, uh, mid-1970s, when we saw, uh, and but particularly after 1980, when... Um, uh, when uh, the Reagan administration was elected, uh, we've seen this huge divergence, uh, the top 1% gaining the vast majority of economic, uh, the benefits of economic growth. Within that top 1%, you can keep on slicing the onion until you get down to Mitt Romney. Um, but at the bottom, uh, essentially, uh, zero, uh, zero improvement in the position of people at the bottom of the income distribution in a country with uh, the most flexible labour markets in, in the developed world. So the notion that these benefits... Uh, will flow through to the majority of the population uh, simply don't stand up. And the picture, you can make some excuses about things like consumer price index for the first couple of decades. Uh, the picture for the last 15 years or so, unrelievedly bleak. Uh, US median household income falling uh, to levels comparable to 1990, even after the CPI has been adjusted, even after all the things that the, all the excuses that can possibly be made have been made. Uh, poverty, I won't go over, but you can again see the same picture. More poor people in the US now than in, um, in, in 1960, and this is an absolute poverty measure. This isn't wishy-washy Australia where we say somebody's poor if they're poorer than the average person. This is somebody's poor if they couldn't afford the household budget of a poor person in 1962. Productivity benefits, well, Judith put up the levels, I've put up the rate of change. Somewhere in that downward slide is work choices. Um, I don't want to put a lot of uh, and it's got worse. Uh, no, actually, right at the end, it actually improves a teeny weeny bit. No, no. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't want to make a big story about this because I don't, I don't place a great deal of weight on these particular numbers and because uh, productivity in the short run is, is mucked around by, by cycles of all kinds. But clearly, uh, clearly, if work choices was the solution, I, I, it certainly doesn't show up in Australia. And, of course, uh, New Zealand, uh, far worse. So, um, my conclusion to put up is uh, the average Australian understands this issue, it, uh, uh, the economic evidence supports them. I've just done the graphs, but the statistical study is trying to find, uh, for example, uh, substantial employment benefits out of, out of relaxed employment pr protection legislation. There's some early studies that showed that, but they haven't stood up to scrutiny. What you see is a bit more variance. Similarly, the claims of drastic adverse effects of minimum wages. None of this stuff is supported in the economics literature. It's all essentially faith-based stuff. Uh, the Australian public doesn't believe it, and neither should you. Thank you. So the answer is no, we don't agree. Um, so uh, I'll ask the first question just to get things moving, and we will have a roving microphone. And Rima, were you around somewhere? Matt? I'll, uh, can you, can you, is there a microphone on the floor? Oh, OK. All right, so Judith, you want to go and rebut first of all? Oh, yeah, sure. Look, I, 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 I'd like to involve the audience more. But look, I guess the, the, the two points uh, I'd like to make is, first of all, is that 
I'm not one of those persons who is just concerned about distribution. The, the, the most important thing is to increase the size of the pie. You increase the size of the pie and then you worry about the distribution. The idea that you'd use labour market regulation, minimum wages, employment protection laws and the like to affect the distribution of income I think is absolute crazy stuff. So we need to have measures to maximise the size of the pie and then you would use aggressively the tax and transfer system to worry about the distribution. If I look at, the, for example, the OECD, which is a very wet organisation, that where they've come out on employment protection, for example, is that employment protection laws, unfair dismissal laws, affect very badly marginal workers. They're the people you're supposed to be worried about. But if you have very strong um, employment protection laws, employers do not want to give that marginal worker, the person who might have been in jail, the person who left school early, a chance. So they absolutely fail the equity test. Um, the idea that the literature on minimum wages is somehow settled, the thing is what happens, and you see this in Australia, is that you put up the minimum wage, then employers, you can see it in the data, they have to reduce the working hours and they reduce training. There is no free lunch. And John, if you thought there was a free lunch, we, you are not being serious. We would have a minimum wage at 50 bucks an hour because if you think there's no effect, you're not being serious by only allowing us to have a mere $15. So it seems to me that, you know, there is an issue, and I don't accept that you would think that, you know. So there is clearly, have we got it right? Probably not. Okay, let me just finally make the point, the lived experience of work choices. There was a lived experience in terms of the scare campaign that was run by the trade union movement, and I don't blame them. I mean, because their institutional um, longevity was being put at risk. I mean, they've got 13% of the private sector workforce who <laughs> join up, and yet, if you look at the legislation, you'd think that they'd virtually all, all, all workers were members of the unions. Their institutional power is way over the odds in relation to their actual membership. But the lived experience for most people was that real wages increased, um, employment grew incredibly strongly. In fact, it was almost all full time. So actually, the lived experience in terms of people's actual outcomes was very good. Um, I just think it shows you that what a you know, good advertising campaign can do. <laughs> John, do you want to respond? Could you go back a couple of slides from... Back, back, back. One more. Yeah, so first, as regards, uh, just worry about the size of the pie, not about the distribution. I mean, the US pie has grown a fair lot since, um, uh, since 1970. Uh, if you're anywhere in the bottom half of that income distribution, you haven't seen any of it. So... Um, so I guess I simply don't accept uh, that as a premise, that um, uh, the fact is it's possible for the pie to grow a great deal and, and for uh, the majority of the population to miss out almost entirely. But you don't but honestly think that's got anything to do with labour market I regulation? I absolutely do. I oh, absolutely yes. do not, well, because in fact, uh, um, labour market regulation... Hey, no, this is my, I think this is my... my sorry, remote. yes, indeed. I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, Judith. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, John, this is my yeah, apologies. Yeah, so, 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 no, I, no, no, I, I, my apologies, I'm slipping. Um, I, mean, I mean, obviously, <laughs> and you're obvi obviously combined with the fact that the tax, tax transfer system was aggressively used to transfer income in the other direction. Now, I'm pleased to hear you're an advocate of ad aggressive use of the tax transfer system to redistribute income away from the wealthy, uh, but sad to say, the majority of, of advocates and the effective ones, uh, if they ever mention it, it's only in the context of debates about labour market. I haven't had much success in persuading the Centre for Independent Studies or the IPA or the Australian uh, to advocate aggressive use of the tax transfer system to uh, fix up about the distributional consequences. Well, we John, do, Judith we? wants to increase the pie here in Australia. Now, the US example is the one you had up on the screen there. Mm. Is it fair to use the US example? I mean, there are real differences between Australia well, and the well, US. The real differences are that the US has had an... Ex you know, the question is how much. I agree entirely with, with Judith that uh, the question is how far should we go. Uh, my view is uh, the US has gone a lot further in the direction advocated by, by Judith than... Um, uh, then uh, Australia has, New Zealand somewhat in between. Uh, the outcomes to me suggest that, uh, and the UK, I could, could have done the UK, which tells a, a similarly intermediate story. The suggestion I would have is uh, we've already gone further away from uh, the optimal balance in the US direction than we should. All right, Judith, can I ask just a quick question, then we'll take questions from the floor. Uh, part of the problem seems to be globalisation and it amplifies international shocks. 
the reason why the debate about labour market deregulation here in Australia has it got sharper because employers or those who hold capital uh, have greater difficulty tackling the globalisation problem, so they look inwards and say, well, we can't tackle the globe, but we can tackle our own issues like labour market deregulation. Um, it's well, an easier thing to tackle. Well, yeah, no, look, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses and employers are working on all fronts. But, I mean, the thing is that when I listen to you, John, what I could un understand is that why would real wages ever go up in your, in your view of the world? In fact, uh, if you look at the wages that Gina Reinhardt's paying, they're, you know, $100,000 plus, you know. Why, why would she do that, you know? The thing is, this is a market. This is about alternatives. And the best way to protect workers is to ensure that you have strong employment growth and they have alternatives. Because the truth of the matter is that this view of the world is that, you know, there are workers who are powerless. There's somehow some major monopsony in Australia that's absolute rubbish. Um, and all powers with the employers. Not so, and particularly not so for small business who often take home um, lower hourly wages than their workers. The truth of the matter is that we need to have a market functioning properly. And there's no point really trotting out the American case. There haven't been big changes to labour market regulations over that period of time. The federal government is very insignificant in terms of labour market regulation. Sure, Ronnie Reagan took on the air traffic controller. So what? Um, it's really, I mean, a lot of what's happened down the bottom is that you've got such a big flood of illegal immigrants coming in. So you've got, you know, it's the market, everyone. It's the market, honey. So you've got such a um, uh, sort of basically reserve army of workers at the low end, and that has kept things very low. John, I'll let you respond to those yeah, questions. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the fact is the minimum wage in the US in real terms has been cut drastically um, since the 1970s. Uh, but Reagan. the states have increased them. That's, that's, no, you're talking the, about the, the real. The, the, the real keep going, John. So the real <laughs> wage uh, across all states has, in, has has fallen has fallen drastically. Uh, the, 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 the air traffic controllers case stands for a whole bunch of legislation, which of course has had the effect of, of not only drastically reducing uh, union density, but also uh, substantially restricting the capacity of uh, of uh, employers to act. And we've had um, and we've had. Uh, We've had as well uh, uh, removal of the social sanctions against employment at will that previously constrained major corporate corporations. So if you go back to the 1970s, although it was probably legal for General Electric or General Motors, say, to work out that they could increase their profits by 5% by sacking 5,000 workers, even though everything was going well, in practice the US social contract wasn't. Uh, it didn't allow that, now it does. And, uh, and that uh, those, those factors have all combined to produce the picture we see here. And the idea that the largest economy in the world, the one that's, that's closest to, most closely approximates the free market, the one that we're always being told to emulate, uh, that the experience of that country is irrelevant and we shouldn't look at it, I, I just find unbelievable. All right. <laughs> Questions from the floor. Your hand, please. We'll have a microphone for you. I don't, right over here, Emma. My apologies. All the way. I wouldn't mind if you, sir, if you could give your name and organisation if you have one, would you? Please. Oh, Ken Howard. I'm a stockbroker with RBS Morgans. Uh, I've got two questions, but I'll just direct the first one to, to Judith. The slide you had up there, um, the last slide I think it was, that had Australia ranking at the top of the uh, charts as far as minimum wage. I'd be curious to see that chart and how much of the movement to our number one ranking is driven by the Australian dollar over the last decade. Because I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that the country has um, in economic history. The reference to the Dutch disease, I think, is a challenge that Australia is going to face. Um, if we're on that chart and we're at a 50 cent dollar, we'd be close to the bottom of that league table. Can I have your thoughts on the Australian dollar? Mm. Uh, they were done in purchasing power parity, so there's, there's, to some extent it kind of smooths off the... The, uh, the, the dollar effect, but, but it, it, it's, a, it's an absolute fair point and that's the point I guess that Steve is making is that we have to now interpret this in a globalised setting. I mean, a lot of, if you look at where the minimum wage is paid, there's a fair proportion which is in the non-traded goods sector, so I guess you know, you're kind of dealing with income elasticities more than uh, competition from overseas, but it, 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 yeah, I mean I think it's a, it's a very reasonable point. Full name and organisation. Hi, John Humphreys, no organisation. Um, <laughs> uh, Judith mentioned it... Sorry? Of any kind. Of any kind, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Judith mentioned it a few times. I wonder if, if John could specifically respond to what do you think would be the consequences of, for example, doubling the minimum wage or, or taking it from 15 to $20? Would there be an employment effect or would there be no effect? And also to, to both of you, if there's an idea that uh, employers shouldn't be allowed to sack an employee without good reason, is there a case to be made that employees shouldn't be able to leave employers without a good reason? So, taking the second first, this is, as I said, a straightforward issue of a zero-sum zero -sum game. Um, my view is uh, the consequences of employees from being sacked are typically considerably more severe than the consequences of employers uh, leaving, uh, losing an employee, and really? therefore not that, always. therefore that not always. I agree. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying there are no gains. I'm saying that, uh, given the relatively modest, given Given the asymmetry in the relationship, uh, the relatively modest protections we have, I don't think are in any way excessive. Uh, obviously, uh, there are responses to, to minimum wages. There are minimum wages that are, are feasible and there are minimum wages that aren't. It's my judgment that at the current level of minimum wages, at, you know, a small increase, you know, a marginal increase, uh, the, the net effect would be to increase the income of low-wage workers as a group rather than reducing it, which is an elastic number. Have you heard? Would there be an employment effect? Well, it's, it, it certainly will be if you push it far enough. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not claiming that uh, we can pay $10,000 a year uh, a week to minimum wage workers. Obviously, there is. But I mean, I don't, I don't see that that's a very helpful question. Hmm. Oh, look, I think it's a fair point. And I mean, David Washer has looked at this. And basically, for those who retain their jobs and retain their hours of work, a higher minimum wage is a plus for them. For those who lose their jobs or have their hours cut back, uh, it obviously is a loss. So you've got to work out the net benefits. And when David Washer of the NBR, in the NBR um, worked it out, it was a net loss. So, well, you know, that's David, okay. David Washer had, had one yeah. view and yeah, yeah, Carden right. Kruger had a different view. And, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, no I one believes yeah. in Carden Kruger anymore because uh, it's going to be completely... Yeah, probably. Yeah, no. Um, but I... Uh, so what was your first point? Was it kind of employment? Oh, yeah. Raising the uh, uh, no, 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 the employment. Well, I think it's a really interesting point because that's right. It's all kind of a one-way street. So, you know, the employer can, you know, walk mm. out the door, um, you know, sue the employer for unfair dismissal. We're not talking about unlawful dismissal. I mean, there's something completely different here. This is just a completely subjective idea. This is unfair dismissal. In days of old, if you were an apprentice, you actually paid to be an apprentice and if you actually left an employer during the period of your apprenticeship, you would have to pay, uh, pay money to the employer. Because... Sorry? Do we have an unfair quitting law to go along? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're on the side of bosses against workers, undoubtedly we should. I mean, that's, it but really is as simple as that. It's, it's, it, you say bosses are some sort of enemies. No. Bosses are the people who invest in the economy, who create the jobs. There are no jobs to fight over if they are not created by the employers, right? The idea that the employers and the employees are not on the same side is completely untrue. They are mm. on the same side. And basically, they should be in partnership, seeing how they can serve the customer as best as they can because at the end of the day the only way to protect employment is to make sure that businesses are profitable. Question about that. Yeah. Gentlemen, you, your name and all of those. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jeff Hines. Um, I'm a director of Bloxish and Ferguson but also run my own executive search business. But I've got a strong background, long background in industrial relations and human resources. I grew up in the UK, worked in uh, HR there with a major organisation which transferred me out here to be the HR director for a major corporation here. One of the first things that staggered me, having worked in industrial relations in the UK, was coming to Australia was the highly legalistic nature of what was going on here. Common sense and good manners just goes out of the window. You've got to work out what's in the award or... I mean, it's just absolutely incredibly stupid to my mind. I then came to, to Brisbane to head up uh, a similar role with a major mining company and I inherited a group industrial relations manager who was an ex-union official. Now, he only knew how to fight in the gutter. And I, if I'd say to him, what's the sensible thing to do in this? He'd say, well, if you look at the award on subsection 13, see, I said, but that's stupid. What is the best way of handling this situation? He couldn't answer it. So what's your question? Now, Professor Quiggan, I just want to give a background first, Steve, but to say, is that... I now run a small business, and I'm a director on what is a small business. 80% of the employees in this state are employed by small business, less than 15 employees. Now, have you ever 
worked in a small business, run a small business, know what it's like to see where the next dollar's coming from? Or are you just sitting in your ivory tower in St. Lucia and dreaming up all these graphs about the United States? Um, I, I didn't actually dream the graph up. Um, yeah, this actually is, <laughs> is what happened Wikipedia. in reality. I'll, I'll take that as a comment. I don't think, I mean, really, this is just the employer's perspective. I mean, this is precisely the point I'm making. This story looks a lot, be, a lot different uh, from the perspective of the boss than from the perspective of the worker. And most of what we're hearing here is very simply uh, you know, the, the case of, you know, the case of uh, a zero-sum story. You know, John put it exactly right. Uh, employers would love it if, if their employees were serfs who couldn't quit. Um, yeah, this really is That's not what he said. That, that, that is not what he said. Oh, I think he said no quitting. He was saying we should have a no quitting law. No, no, I don't think we should. Um, oh, sorry, I, I missed the retirement no, but, nature but of But it's question. a really important point because people who have to make payroll have a different perspective. Absolutely. You are not the enemy of your workers. To. It is not. It is not. Exactly. You have every incentive to get the best out of your workers. And the way you're setting up the world, John, is not the world of business. They are actually on the same side. So is the problem the way we incentivise workers? There's that word. Well, I, 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 yeah, I hope, hope, but it's a really, <laughs> hope at least we can have a war against This is a really important point. We have a regulatory arrangement which is adversarial, which is complex, which involves tribunals. We don't want that. You want who, who, a when you say we don't want that, I mean the Australian public absolutely does want that. Well, do they realise it? Well, they, they, I mean, they, 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 yeah, I mean, John. So can I ask you for small business people? There does seem to be an issue for small business people yeah. in terms of managing, you know, this less yeah. than fifteen people. The the amount of time and effort when they're trying to grow a business, the time it takes to manage their labour relations does seem to be a major issue detracting from their ability to, to try and work out where they want to take their small business. Sure. In other words, grow it into something sure. bigger so they can employ more people. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And uh, we have the problem that there are many good small business people trying to do that, but also, and, you know, I have worked for the odd one or two, uh, small business people who aren't like that at all, um, whose employees... Uh, uh, so that's a problem of humanity, not of, uh, not of yeah. money. Or and, it's a and it's a problem, which is why... And the Lord I mean, if we, if, if, we didn't have, if we didn't have any bad things happening in society, we wouldn't need any of these legalistic laws or crimes or courts or juries well, or any of those things. We'd, we'd, all just, uh, we'd all just get on and do the right thing. I'm Another question the from the floor. Same table, gentlemen. Name an organisation, please, sir. Graham. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Graham Haycroft. Well, I guess I'm... Uh, I'm just myself now, but a couple of months ago I used to employ about 2,000 people across 150 businesses. I now have a little hobby. I, I, I actually provide services to, to new start-up unions. So there you are, I'm playing both sides of the fence. <laughs> Your question for our guests. My question is, now uh, I'll lead on to, we seem to be sort of locked in, a, in, a, in the old paradigm, I'll call it, um, about who knows best what the worker wants. Why don't we actually ask the worker? For instance, unfair dismissal. Is it good? Is it bad? Unfair dismissal has a real cost. I know I made a lot of money out of providing people on a labour hire arrangement which got people out of that. So I know how much it's worth to an employer. It's worth about 10% of payroll actually to get out of that. But why don't we ask the worker how much they value it? So the question is, I guess, to what extent should we ask the workers to decide these issues about if we have a zero-sum game, which I think is rubbish, but let's assume for the state of the argument that we do have a zero-sum game. Should we not then get more value out of the system by allowing the workers to determine the values of the different things? Should, in fact, they be stuck in a penalty rate regime which may prevent them from earning money on a weekend when they might prefer to get extra money? Or should that decision be made by someone else or by them? Should people be able to put a value on unfair dismissal? So, so in the question workplace is... workplace contracts? In work a workplace contract, why should not uh, an issue like unfair dismissal be a negotiable value? Can I... Well, let me ask our So that's the question, because... Uh, let me just qualify a little bit. Obviously, in a good business, I would like to think in businesses that I ran that it wouldn't be worth very much at all because they would know they're not going to be sacked. In a bad business, it would be very expensive for the employer to buy it out. So I'd just like to hear the, the, uh, the debaters' comments on this particular concept of letting the worker decide 
as opposed to having these rules decided for them by regulatory bodies. Workplace contracts seem to provide that under work uh, well, choices sorry, in certain I mean, circumstances. I mean, I know democracy is an unfashionable concept. Um, uh, yeah, well, but uh, the workers get to vote. They don't. They can decide in a couple of ways. One is they can decide in face-to-face -face negotiations with their employers. The other is they can vote for laws uh, which change things. And there's no doubt which way Australian workers are voted on this stuff. Um, yeah, they may be deceived. It may be that the union advertising campaign, a fraction of the cost of the government's advertising campaign, which we all paid for, uh, saying what good stuff this was, was incredibly clever in tricking Australian workers into, into voting against their own interests. And it may be that uh, that, that delusion has persisted year after year since then. But my perception is uh, the average Australian doesn't like this stuff, doesn't want it, and a right not to do so. But you're not answering the question. The question well, is... Yes, I am. I'm no, asking the question, in what, no, in what mode should we make this choice? And the answer is... Oh, because you, OK, so you will not allow workers to opt out of something for a price because Sorry. you know better. So no, one size no, I'm not saying I know better. I'm, I'm, yeah, well, I'm, I, I, think I, 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 I think it's a jolly good idea because take, for example, I mandatory mean, rates. There are plenty of people who not only would be happy to work on, those, on Saturdays, Sundays and public holidays, that is the only time they can work. And the idea that we have a one-size-fits-all where people are actually being paid way above their reservation price uh, and what happens is that, like up in the Sunshine Coast, you know, it become a public holiday, most of the restaurants are actually closed. That is a lose-lose situation, John, because it is too expensive um, to open. I, I just point this rates. graph again. I mean, this, this hey. notion that there are no losers, yeah, I mean, it's just not but true. Can you finish your statement, Judith? Sorry. Well, I mean, honestly, I mean, the American situation is so far removed from the Australian situation that it is of no polemical value at all. The, the fact of the matter is that those people Sorry. down the bottom were basically, um, you know, overwhelmed by the illegal immigration. No, that's no, fine, that, that, and that, it had some benefits. That's been studied extensively, you know. and it's totally false. That is not true. Yeah. That is true. I can show you the studies. But the point is, I mean, this is a liberal idea that, you know, that sort of believers in big government don't like. The idea that people could voluntarily opt out of an arrangement for money. Why would you have any objection to that, John? So uh, workplace well, work I mean, contracts like, under no, the old people, work choices I mean, why, why, why shouldn't I say to my no, employer, sorry. look, forget the permanent job. I'm happy to have a fixed-term job, but I want you to pay more. What well, is wrong with well, that? Well, because I mean, I am imagining because the situation. I'm, I'm imagining, no, I'm afraid I'm imagining the situation when my employer comes to me and says, oh, I've spoken to three other people and they're prepared to take your job at a lower, a lower well, rate. that's OK. That's the market. Yeah, no, sorry, OK, but fine. I think we've <laughs> answered the question why people might not like that idea. So, John, you don't think it's possible for a, an employee at a small business to negotiate their own conditions with an employer? I think, think the of outcome of... Yeah, I think, think the evidence on the outcome of these negotiations is that... Because people um, are stupid. Is uh, that what you're saying? No. So, sorry, finish your answer, John. So, I think the evidence on the outcome is pretty clear and... I, I just keep on wondering why is Judith running away from a labour market? Yeah, which features of the US, of you, which additional regulations would you introduce in the US to prevent this kind of outcome being, re, being reproduced, other than restrictions on migration? So, well, uh, yeah, the, I think the, the evidence is clear that, the, that on balance the outcome is that workers well, will get I worse complete, conditions from this I completely understand that you actually said that mo macro tells you nothing, that it's multifactorial. No, the I, reasons I for that has got very little to do with labour market regulation, which pretty much was, was the same over that period and is mainly handled by the states in any case, not by the federal government. Well, I didn't say anything, I didn't say anything about so, which level of government. So help me, just for me, just for me clarify. So, John, you don't think that workplace contracts can be negotiated by individual workers with employers <laughs> and small business? Well, I think, I think the effect of a scheme of that kind will be to reduce wages and conditions, yes. I mean, I don't, 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 not saying they can't be, obviously. They can be, and they but are in the US. If, if that is to the satisfaction of an employee, well, would that rel, be a positive? Well, rel, rel, relative to the alternatives available to them. I mean, if in the US, in the US, those, those, those contracts are negotiated, and since the alternative is, um, uh, the alternative is uh, a much worse wage somewhere else, if anything, um, people accept ah, wages of, of $10 an hour or whatever. Well, exactly, it's the market. Okay. All right, another question. Yes, it is before, the market. Please. I mean, Regulation's sorry, not going to okay. change that. Uh, hi. Uh, Question, please, sir. <laughs> yeah, Cameron Murray, uh, UQ, PhD student. Hi, everyone. I know a fair few people. Uh, just a statement. First, statement, two questions. I'll try and be quick. The last one about people negotiating their, their contracts individually. I, I, I don't know. Look, I, I know a lot of people who, um, 
who work minimum wage jobs, and they would have no idea. They would read a clause in a contract and just be like, uh, whatever, sign on the bottom line. They'd get walked all over and have no bargaining power, no skill. This, this guy, oh, sorry, I forgot your name. Would, Graham would get a lot more uh, money taken off from all these individual negotiations, dealing with legal cases and the like. I, I, look, at some point, society... So people are stupid, is that what you're yeah. telling me? Well, Some they're, people. I just completely unaccepted. So, not so accepted. you're very familiar. You can read any law and understand how to interpret it perfectly. Because you're going to ask basically 15 year old people who've just walked out of school, possibly failed school, and go, "Oh, here's a contract. Can you just interpret that and sign sign away?" That's what you're asking. Anyway, that's my statement. The two questions are: Can someone on the on the panel, uh, John or Judah, tell me a story about the productivity connection here? Tell me a story about, well, I, I couldn't fire this guy. It took me a few months, and and tell me how that translates to this productivity number here, Australia-wide, can you make that connection, talk me through it? Because, you know, in, in my mind, productivity is, you know, um, J John mentioned there's a lot of factors and cyclical factors involved and, um, you know, I'm having a hard time believing that this is going to be a major impact. And, and the other one is, I think it's Jeff, is that right? Um, can you tell me exactly, you know, which law you would change, you say your employer's small business? Well, you know, can you tell, be really specific so we can get some real examples going here? You know, but Judith and Job will have to answer that. <laughs> Sorry, so that was two questions. One is the productive link and one is, you know, a direct clause. What would, what would you put in your contracts if you, if you could? Yes. Hmm. Well, of course. I mean, um, yeah. All right. John, John or Judith? <laughs> okay, let me tell you one little story, actually. I've got a very good friend who have, has been a friend of mine for 40 years who ran a camping business in Adelaide. He had an employee who who was stealing from him, all right? My friend is a really nice person. He actually had the CCTV footage to show him taking money out of the till. But instead of actually deciding to sack him, he said to the guy, oh, look, business has fallen off, I've got to let you go. Okay, the next week, the guy sued him for unfair dismissal. My friend said to him, well, by the way, you were stealing. That person said, bad luck, you didn't go to the police, and he was awarded $10,000 by the tribunal. Can you tell me, can you look me in the eye and can you tell me that that's fair? Okay, what happened was that that story, he was in a precinct in the Adelaide CBD, went around that area and no one but no one wanted to take a chance in employing anyone. What happened was that he and his family all worked through the weekend. They would have otherwise employed people. They were too scared to employ people. Is that a good outcome? Can I go back? John, can I go back to? Can I go back to two slides? And we'll John, just, we'll have to wrap it up. Here. That yeah. is not John, fair. Yeah. So let, let me just point out the evidence. Yeah, you know, this is all anecdotal stuff and faith from the employer side of the story. This, the numbers don't back it up, and the U.S. experience, well, the which is absolutely relevant. The OECD shows you the pernicious effects of employment. The U.S. experience is protection. absolutely relevant, and the U.S. experience, yeah, the, the employment numbers show in a regime well, with none of these concerns. That's not uh, true. There's a lot of litigation in terms of unfair dismissal. That is not true what you even say. Uh, well, so, so, so you're now saying the US is not, the US has too much labour market regulation? No, no. I'm saying the outcomes have got very little to do with labour market regulation so and John, have absolutely no so, power so, to Australia. Yeah, so, so, so I'll finish your answer because I'll have sure, to... Sure, yeah. So, 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 so my, well. yeah, my first, briefly on productivity, productivity is driven, yeah, Paul was slightly unfortunate, well, he wasn't interpreting, expecting what Australians would take of this because we have these weird ideas about productivity here. Productivity is driven almost entirely by technological change. Uh, in the short run... Well, then everyone would in have the the short, In the short run, productivity, and indeed, in, the develop, in developed countries, they, they pretty much do. And, um, I mean, the, well, sorry, the US has lower productivity per hour than lots of other countries because, uh, or had low, lower productivity per hour because it, for, until relatively recently, it employed more low school workers, but um, oh, good. Uh, but that, that, yeah, the US has now become uh, below average in those respects. It now has a lower employment population ratio than most European countries and correspondingly has picked up in terms of productivity. But the real driver here is technological change, labour market regulation and the state of the macro cycle shuffle these things about. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's my point on that. One more question from the floor, then I'll ask Michael Knox to wrap, up, wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Courtney Chester from the Queensland Competition Authority. Um, I was hoping to ask a question, I guess, about two sort of separate scenarios of trade-offs as opposed to employees versus em employers and get your comments on them. And I'll just 
put a couple of caveats at the front, which we're all well known for. The first one being I'm aware that neither circumstance applies to me, fortunately, and the second that there are lots of very big generalisations which I'll ask you to overlook for this sake. Um, but the first one is I have a lot of friends who perhaps say 35 years old and under who would argue that deregulation has the effect of transferring opportunity and therefore future earnings from people in their demographic to baby boomers who benefited from free education, permanent jobs and highly protected wages while they were gaining experience. Um, and the second group being very, very low wage earners who I think as Cameron and a few people have pointed out, even if they could interpret their contracts and make cases about um, what, what they should or shouldn't be entitled to are so easily replaceable that they would never be able to bargain with an employer. And so that by deregulating the market, you're actually only helping the people with the skills and um, now, I guess, to benefit themselves. But you see, I just don't accept that second point because, you know, um, regulation and legislation is, does not do anything to change the alternative opportunities for low-skilled, low-wage workers, you know. <laughs> that remains the market setting, right? So you can, you can get the regulation to set the price above the market clearing wage and so a whole lot of people don't get jobs. Well, great, you know. For those who get jobs, it might look like a good thing. But I, I just can't believe this view of the world, you know. I mean, you know, my children uh, went through universe, school and university uh, and they were low-wage workers, and, I mean, they knew all about it. I mean, the idea that we've got some bunch of complete sort of zombies going around having absolutely no idea, I think you'll find that most low-wage workers know to the last, you know, dollar, well, last cent about their entitlements. So this idea that somehow the big brother government will come in one size fits all, and this will kind of protect these low-skilled workers who have very few alternatives. I mean, it's, I mean, surely this is why we did economics, to understand that there is a cost in this kind of regulation. But it does protect the lowest, the lowest level. Oh, what about the ones who don't get jobs? What's protective in that? Um, yeah, I mean, John, what is yeah, protective I, I, in I that? just comment. I mean, I really John. think, it, you know, hearing what Judith has said, it's hard to find a single thing she said that is more than a statement of faith based on a reading of an econ textbook. The evidence, you know, Whenever we put up, I've put up empirical evidence. New Zealand I doesn't count. The US doesn't count. And I had very good Australian evidence, which showed what a, what a good well, thing work choices was, I, um, which was every bit as persuasive as your macro charts, John. Um, I th think there was, as I mentioned, a There's bit of a difference a very, in the macro shops no, there. No, 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 multi this, this has been the best economic society lunch I've ever done. <laughs> uh, the answer is work for Clive Palmer. <laughs> um, no. I'll get Michael Lobster to wrap it up and make a brief presentation to our guests, please, Mike. Well, thank our guests first of all. Welcome to this meeting at the Economic Society of Australia, Queensland Division. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember. Well, you know, it's a sad comment on the life of an economist that I can't remember when I had so much fun. Um, uh, Steve Austin came to a speech that I gave last Wednesday at uh, the United Services Club, which is one of the beautiful old 1920s clubs, which is up here on Wickham Terrace. And I started by talking about um, uh, when I was 27 years old and I lived on the desert road to Alexandria. And my then very blonde wife and I used to walk down from our hotel to the Mina House Hotel every morning, hire, hire horses uh, and ride around uh, the pyramids, uh, the Pyramid of Cheops and the Pyramid of Kefren, come back, give the horses back uh, to the stables and, and then walk down and learn Arabic every morning for, uh, for four months. After that, I've always believed in the blonde. Um, um, so I'm wonderfully grateful for Judith Sloan for, for coming to present today. Um, uh, I spoke to John Humphreys before and I introduced him as the man from no organisation of any kind. Uh, he is of course the uh, president of the Australian Libertarians Association which 
demonstrates exactly what I meant. Um, John Quiggan, um, as I say, um, the big shot, uh, when I go to the world of big shots, it's a privilege to have him in the room. Um, for me, um, in over the last couple of years, uh, we had an event like this down by the park with Joe Stiglitz. Uh, I knew he was really bright, uh, not just because he was a Nobel Prize winner, but because he laughed at my jokes. And last month, uh, Jadesh Bhagwati, sitting in, in exactly that same uh, seat just over there where I was sitting today, uh, spent about an hour and a half telling me uh, about how Joe Stiglitz was uh, an intellectual fraud and, <laughs> and not worth uh, his Nobel Prize. Uh, one of my private dreams, my private dreams, I have this, uh, uh, this restaurant uh, in downtown near Battery Park um, where uh, George Washington uh, said farewell. It's a 19th century building where George Washington sent farewell to his, uh, uh, to his imperial staff. And I'd like to take him, uh, Jagdash and Joe, down there to lunch or dinner and have a friend of mine from uh, Venezuela who owns a bank uh, who's wonderfully literate and sit around a table and just knock it out. And, and the thing I'd really like about that is when you go to that restaurant, which is the most beautiful part of New York City on the east side, just a block away from uh, J.P. Morgan, that you can get uh, uh, four courses and very good wines for $100 each, and that's competitiveness. And that's what the issue is about, the competitiveness of the U.S. economy relative to the competitiveness uh, of the Australian economy. Um, in a great line, um, which I use frequently at these events, which I stole unashamedly from John Quiggan, I would now like to talk about the history of the society. The society, uh, as we know it, started in 1926. Uh, but we like to acknowledge not just those traditions, but the traditions that go back all the way to 1805. Uh, in 1805 in Australia, there was a series of far-sighted central bankers who saw the time when Australia would have its own currency, which could be exchanged for goods and services, the first time a uniquely Australian currency. Uh, Aust sadly... The British authorities stomped on this and called it the Rum Rebellion. <laughs> but we have always accepted in this society the importance of exchanging uh, alcohol for services rendered. <laughs> so we'd like to present these very fine bottles of Australian wine to our two speakers. Thank you very much for presenting for us today. Uh, our next presentation, uh, I think, is on the 16th of October. 16th of October by U Uwe Dalek. Um, Uwe was the, um, uh, the editor of our journal, and uh, we look forward to your attendance at our next presentation on the 16th of October. Thank you very much.